Welcome. And welcome to the celebration of the life and work of Aaron Schwartz, a man who is a spark for many of us. I would like to thank the staff of the Internet Archive, Lisa Ryan, the organizer Shannon Lee, Steve Walling, Carl Malaman, and Cindy Cohn for helping pull this together. As you probably know, there are memorials going on all over the world, hackathons going on. There's an Aaron SW IRC chat uh, for those that are following the, the, the hackathons. And these proceedings are in the public domain. Um, this isn't the type of event we imagined for this space, but I can think of uh, no better. Um, to the organizer uh, and coordinator for this evening uh, is Shannon Lee, and uh, he will start our program. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Aaron Swartz has left behind a challenging legacy. Tonight, we're going to talk about Aaron and what he left behind and what we can do to carry it forward. We're going to have an array of speakers, beginning with Danny O'Brien and ending with Carl Malmood. And after that, we'll have an opportunity to share right here. I will see you at the end of the speakers. Um, so I first met Aaron in 2001, uh, when Aaron was, I guess, um, 14 and was already a, a leading light um, working with Tim Berners-Lee uh, on what uh, on the project to, that, that we know as the semantic web, an incredibly ambitious idea to encode in, uh, in machine-readable form all of the, the world's knowledge. And of course, being a journalist at the time, um, I, I seized on this opportunity to sneak an explanation of the semantic web past my editor. Um, it's almost impossible to get any editor to understand the semantic web, but the idea of a 14-year-old boy helping Tim Berners-Lee um, will always pass muster, even if they don't know who Tim Berners-Lee is. <laughs> um, the editor, of course, is in charge of titling the article, and with that supreme lack of understanding, he actually titled it um, A Teenager in a Million, which, of course, was to miss the point entirely. Um, the point was that Aaron's age wasn't a particularly unique thing, and Aaron himself wasn't the exceptional part of this. The exceptional part of this was an institution that allowed someone like Aaron to walk in through its door, and before anyone had noticed where he came from, or what age he was, or what his background was, they allowed him to start contributing good work and learning from his, his peers. Um, an institution is not truly open until somebody you could never even imagine exists walks through the door. Um, when Tim Berners-Lee described these moments um, at, at Aaron's funeral uh, a week ago, you, you, you could see in a way that only Tim Berners-Lee can convey the sort of glee he had that at last this system was working. These open mailing lists, this open discussion, this exchange of information was bringing new people into building the web. He told me then, I was worried about revealing my age, and I did my best to keep it a secret. Now I let my words speak for themselves. And since then, so many words. Some written in machine-readable form in Python for computers. Some written in brimstone and sulfur for Congress-readable forms. Um, and all of it in plain text. All of it in plain language for everyone to read. And if he could not read enough words himself, uh, his programs read and scraped and passed the rest. Aaron loved beautiful code. I think the only time I really ever pained him was when I'd said some program that he'd written and I'd looked at was unreadable. Uh, it turned out that it wasn't actually his code at all. He'd, uh, he'd written some code that had in turn written that code. <laughs> and, and yet I think it still hurt that, that, that somehow his, his own child had not inherited his own delicate sensitivities. 
Words fail, fail me now, even though I have them written down here. I mean, try as hard as Aaron did. I, I don't think you could ever encode all of his experience in words. And I don't think that all of the relationships that he built between so many different peers and so many new people coming in could be ever expressed in any number of RDF triplets. I, I mean, I can, I can sort of try and convey the, 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 the look on Aaron's face when he, he played with my daughter Aaron, um, nine. There were some pictures downstairs that you may have seen. Um, but you can't really convey that childish glee that most of us lose, well, long before we begin work on the semantic web, at least. Um, and I can't really describe to you the, 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 the pain and frustration when Aaron so effectively demolished a defense I had of John Searle's Chinese room argument that I actually picked, threw down my, my knife and fork and stormed out of my own chi uh, Christmas dinner. Um, <laughs> leave, leaving, of course, the turkey for Aaron to fail to eat. Um, there was always a sort of pleasure and ease in, in forgiving Aaron for those sort of arguments and also to watch him so easily forgive the rest of us. And I don't think any, any archive can, can hold those moments. But if I can share with you some code, if I can, can't share with you the code that made up Aaron, I can, I hope, share with you the code that Aaron believed could make more Aaron's. Aaron became Aaron because of his unfettered access to information and the knowledge and sharing of, of his peers. Uh, he was very lucky in that respect. He had an incredibly loving family who, um, who, who supported him, who would pay for him to fly out to meetings. Uh, he had a computer. He had all the privileges and benefits that being a young man in the United States of America in the end of the 20th century have. But he also had something new. He had a new advantage, which was that the, the, the gates of the construction of this technology that was beginning to share information were beginning to open up. And he was one of the first, yes, the youngest, but one of the first to take advantage of that and use his curiosity and his, his drive, even at that age, to nip in through there and begin sharing almost immediately with his peers. And if anything bound together all of Aaron's crusades, it was his belief that he was not alone in this. He was not exceptional, and he believed he was not unique, and that there were more than him out there with his curiosity and talent. People say, when we talked about Aaron's work of taking the content of academic papers or the content of the US legal system and opening it up for anyone to use and see and crunch and peruse, um, uh, you know, who, who really is this for? Who, who wants to know about the legal system can't in some way ask a friend or a contact to get access to, to, um, to PACER? Who, who really has a craving for academic knowledge can't find somebody and sneak their way into MIT or another institution and just get that information or, or work to access it? And those people forget. Uh, they forget that if Aaron was a teenager in a million, that soon, very soon, as we continue the great work that we're indulged in here, that there will be six billion people that we will connect to the world's information networks. And out of those six billion people, there will be 1.2 billion teenagers. And if my editor's statistics are correct, and he never understood statistics either, um, then there will be... 1,200 errands out there. There are 1,200 errands out there right now who are as smart and engaged and as curious and as driven as Aaron was, but they simply don't have access to that information. Um, there is no closed archives, no carefully guarded ivory tower that can seat billions. But the open society, the open and world wide web, the free culture that Aaron worked for is for all of those people. And if we give them what they need, if we give them the knowledge to feed their curiosity and the care that we must never forget they need, that, that, that amazing sort of resource of, of, of future errands from Kibera, from Gangzhou or Asan, all of those people will come and they will build the kind of things that Aaron was dreaming of. And so even though we've, we've, we've lost one Aaron, we do have a potential, by continuing his work, to find so many more. Aaron told me back in 2001 that one of the things that the web teaches us is that everything is connected, hyperlinks, 
and that we should all work together standards. Too often school teaches us that everything is separate and that we should all work alone. I think one of the many, many tragedies of, of, of the situation that we find ourselves in now is that at least in some moment of Aaron's life, his belief that he was not alone failed him. And for a few moments, he believed himself to be alone. And I'm sure out there, there are many, many 14-year-old children who feel the same way, that they have that binding curiosity, that fascination, and that urge to change the world. And they worry for a moment that it's just them, that they're alone. And there are no tools, and no capabilities, and no friends to help them continue in that path. I don't think it's ever too soon to begin working with the rest of the world. And I think we all need to stay together and never, ever again leave our friends too alone. A boy's will is the wind's will. And the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts. The night before Aaron died, um, he and I shared a grilled, grilled cheese sandwich. This is one of his favorite foods, as probably many of you know, there weren't, there weren't that many of those favorite foods. It was a really good grilled cheese sandwich. He was really happy about it. A week before he died, uh, we woke up one morning and he said, we really need to talk about Bayesian statistics. And I said, right now, it's Sunday morning, it's like 7 a.m., can it wait? And he said, no, it's really important. And we spent the next couple hours working through a naughty Bayesian statistics problem. He'd already asked the internet with no, no, ut no useful responses. I have the notes. We ended up with a naughty double integral that neither of us could solve. But if anybody here wants to help me with the solution, let me know. <laughs> um, he was really excited the last couple months. He was working on uh, a drug policy research with a friend of his, Matt Stoller, for GiveWell. And he would read these articles, all, all the academic literature, talk to the experts. Um, he got really into this one particular study about uh, a Hawaii, an intervention that had been tried in Hawaii for alcoholism. Um, controlled tests sh indicated that it, it you know, got 90% of alcoholics dry in the first month. And he just was so bubbling over with excitement about all of it. We went to Burlington, Vermont over New Year's. He got the flu, but he came out and played mafia one evening with the friends that we rented a house with. And I was really surprised because he didn't like playing games at all. But uh, Ada, Danny's daughter, was there with us, and he really wanted to see what would happen if Ada, Ada was the mafia. Um, <laughs> and unfortunately, nobody selected Ada as the mafia, which Ada was really annoyed about. But <laughs> um, one of the things that I loved about Aaron was the sheer number and variety and multitude of wonderful, fascinating people who animated his life. I had the great privilege of sharing that life with him for the last 20 months, but I know that I only met a small fraction of the people whose lives he touched. And that's why I came out here um, today, was because I know that many of you were important to him, and I wanted to meet you. And I want to tell you the stories, like the stories I just told, because I think it's really important that his friends, his family, his colleagues, his admirers, know that he had a lot to live for and that he had a lot of happy moments in those last few weeks and months. I'm also here with another message. Aaron's death should radicalize us. The trial and the case hung over our entire relationship. We started dating a few weeks before he was indicted, a couple months after he had been arrested. I met his parents for the first time at 12.30 a.m. the night before the indictment and spent five hours with them in the courthouse the next day. They didn't know I existed before that, so that was a, 
interesting first meeting. <laughs> he, um, he, had told me, he hadn't told me what was going on when we first started dating. All I knew that was that there was something bad happening in his life and that I was a good distraction from it. Um, he called it the bad thing. And I had wild speculation about what it might be. Um, my leading candidate theory at one point was that he was having an affair with Elizabeth Warren and was going to ruin her career. <laughs> um, <laughs> he called me one night when I was at Frisbee practice in D.C. and he was in Boston and he said, the bad thing might be in the news tomorrow. Do you want to hear what it is from me or do you want to read about it in the news? And I said, I want to hear from you. And he said, well... I've been arrested for downloading too many academic journal articles and they're trying to make an example out of me. And I said, well, that doesn't actually sound like a very big deal. <laughs> and he paused for a second and he said, yeah, I guess it's not like anybody has cancer. In the end, it kind of was like that. The only time I was ever really worried about him before the last week was when he was trying to decide whether accept, to accept the plea bargain. It just, the whole thing was so hard and so stressful. And he felt, he carried so much of the weight of it on his own. He didn't want to involve any of his friends. He wanted to protect people, but he wasn't very good at protecting himself. I went to Boston with him last month in December for a hearing, um, and the trial got uh, the the judge grant, granted another evidentiary hearing about whether evidence should be admitted, and the trial was delayed for another couple of months. And he came out of the courthouse, and I tried to give him a hug, a courtroom. I tried to give him a hug, and he pushed me away. He said, not in front of Hyman, not in front of Steve Hyman, the prosecutor. He said, I don't want to show him that. I don't want to show him any vulnerability. I think Aaron made the wrong choice two weeks ago. I think the odds were decent at the trial, and I think, even if he hadn't won, that life still was worth living. But I think he woke it up two years after this ordeal started, and I think he just couldn't face another day of the stress the uncertainty, the lack of control over his own destiny. Aaron's death should radicalize us. And I mean that specifically about us, about you if you're here in this room or if you're watching this online. Aaron died because of deep injustice in this world. Aaron loved to talk about the five whys of the Toyota management system. And so I'm going to ask why. Why did Aaron die? Aaron died in part because we live in a system where the constitutional rights we've all come to believe in through civic classes and through watching law and order don't actually apply in the real world. There's no right to a speedy trial. It had been two years since Aaron was arrested. We still didn't have all the evidence that the, the government, the government still hadn't turned over all of the evidence to us that they were constitutionally required to do so. Why does that happen? In part, it's because the system is so clogged up with cases and has so few human resources. It takes years for practically anybody who actually wants to go to trial to find out whether they're guilty from a jury of their peers. It takes them years because the system is so clogged up and so under-resourced with drug cases and with you know, senseless, the senseless overcrowding of our criminal justice system. Prosecutors aren't used to going to trial. Last year, only 3% of all federal charges were taken to, to, to trial. Most of the rest were resolved in plea bargaining. Plea bargaining processes give prosecutors enormous amounts of power. Um, imagine being totally innocent of any crime and not having the resources that Aaron had at his disposal and the networks and the support. Many people feel they have no choice but to accept a plea bargain. They can't afford lawyers for two years. And you could say in, that, in some sense that Aaron's death was caused by the war on drugs. He wasn't a victim directly, but he was a casualty of that war that's aimed actually at quite different people from Aaron. Aaron's death should radicalize us. 
He died because of a prosecutor and a U.S. attorney who had immense individual power over his life and were more interested in making a high-profile example out of Aaron than in justice or in mercy. Why did they do it? In the case of the prosecutor, Steve Hyman, the best theory I can offer is that he's simply a vindictive old man who really doesn't like young upstart whippersnappers like Aaron who are trying to save the world. Hyman's the kind of guy who wants to claim a notch on his belt and high-five other prosecutors at lunch, but we have to follow the whys. Why does this man have the power to ruin the life of someone like Aaron? We can trace the problem to tough-on-crime initiatives that have systematically transferred power from the hands of judges to prosecutors. We can trace it to punitive sentencing guidelines and ambiguous overreaching laws like the CFAA that give prosecutors the power to charge someone with decades in crime decades in prison for a victimless crime. In the case of Carmen Ortiz, the U.S. attorney who's Hyman's boss, Aaron's case was a stepping stone to higher political ambitions. Ortiz wanted to be a judge or a governor or a senator someday. She probably still wants to be. And unfortunately, in our society, one of the well-trodden paths to, to elected office is through the prosecutor's office. That means that from mayor's offices to Congress, leaders are disproportionately people who've made their name in being tough on crime. They're people who've spent the bulk of their career trying to lock people up. They're people whose job it is to be punitive and not just or merciful. That's how we end up with these kinds of laws to begin with. They're, peop they're people who embody a legal system that locks up more than 25% of the prisoners in the world and we have only 3% of the world's population. Why do we vote for these people? Why do we provide them with the incentives we do? Why do we as a country applaud and reward them and build structures around them as they lock up more than one-third of the black men in our country? Aaron's death should radicalize us because he's probably the first person that most people in this room have ever met who got swept up by this system. But there are literally millions of others whose lives are destroyed in this country. And Aaron would have been the last person who would want us to fetishize his experiences or to treat him as exceptional. In response to Aaron's death, I and his family are calling for five things. First, Steve Hyman and Carmen Ortiz must be held accountable. Second, MIT has lost its way and it must find it again. MIT could have saved Aaron with a single public statement and it refused. Third, all academic research from all time should be made openly accessible to anyone with an internet connection. Fourth, we have to amend the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to prevent prosecutors from these kinds of overreaches. And fifth, we have to reform a criminal justice system where we incarcerate millions of people and prosecutors throw the book at someone like Aaron, but not a single banker has gone to prison since the financial crisis. Aaron's death should radicalize us, but Aaron's life should also radicalize us in a very different way. One of Aaron's favorite shows was Louie. And there's an episode, and I'm going to do my best Louie impression, which probably isn't very good. The episode where Louie gives a little stand-up routine. I drive an infinity. That's really evil. There are people who just starve to death. That's all they ever did. There are people who are, like, born and go, uh, I'm hungry. Then they die, and that's all they ever got to do. Meanwhile, I'm driving in my car, having a great time, and I sleep like a baby. It's totally my fault, because I could trade my Infinity in for any other car, and I'd get back like $20,000, and I could save hundreds of people from dying of starvation with that money. And every day, I don't do it. Every day, I make them die with my car. Aaron loved that routine, and he realized something when, he wa when we watched it together. He realized that Louis copied this bit right out of Peter Singer. This is a Peter Singer essay as a comedy routine. Peter Singer was one of Aaron's favorite philosophers, and he's a really uncomfortable philosopher. A lot of people don't like thinking about Peter Singer. Here's why. Let's say you knew that you had the power to change a law that would save innocent people's lives. 
maybe stopping a carcinogen from polluting groundwater near town. Let's say you knew it would save 10 people's lives, and you chose to do something else instead, something that didn't have much bearing or impact on the world. Are you culpable? Peter Singer would say yes. Most of us studiously avoid answering that question, because the truth is we're faced with questions like, should we trade in our infinity or should we work on the carcinogen every day? It's really hard to live your life thinking about that. But Aaron, Aaron's life should radicalize us. Aaron lived a, a Singerian life more than anyone else I've ever met. Aaron had money. We all know he could have had a lot more if he had tried. But he lived out of backpacks and he stayed on people's couches. Sometimes, I'll admit, it went a little too far. Like the time we'd been dating for a few months and we were meeting up in Boston, and it was his responsibility to find us a place to stay. He thought that an air mattress on his brother Noah's bathroom floor was perfectly sufficient. <laughs> but I respected him for it. He didn't buy an infinity. He didn't get a nice apartment. When he died, he left his estate primarily to give well, probably the most Singerian of all charities. But living a life of personal austerity and charity isn't enough. Aaron felt responsible not just for the direct costs of his lifestyle, but for the opportunity costs. He felt responsible for the carcinogens he wasn't stopping. Here in Silicon Valley, the idea of changing the world is no mirage. You see examples all around you every day of people who've changed the world. And Aaron was one of those people. But the question is, how are they changing the world? Facebook has changed the world, sure. But is the world better off because of Facebook? And even more importantly, if you're deciding whether to take a job at Facebook, is that the place in the world where you can do the most good? Aaron wanted to do the most good. He wanted to apply the lean startup framework to impact. He was learning and iterating. He thought we all needed to think both bigger and smaller. He said to a few of my friends once, the revolution will be A-B tested. <laughs> That's what he was trying to do. So I'm here to ask the hard questions today. If you're not already working to change the criminal justice system in the US, what are you working on? Is it more important than that? It might be, there are more important things. There are places where you can have more impact. But there are so many ways, so many things that need to be changed about this world. Which one of them are you working on? Aaron's death should radicalize us and his life should radicalize us. The fact is we live in a world in which very few people we know pay the ultimate price for their political beliefs. We live in a world in which very few people we know even suffer serious life-altering consequences for their political beliefs. But we live in a runaway global political economy that's taking people's lives every day. Aaron wasn't trying to become a martyr when he downloaded those JSTOR articles. But he was taking a risk on behalf of the billions of people around the world who grew up without his privilege. More of us need to do that. There's so many ways to have impact, so many ways to help people. Aaron had an exchange with David Siegel, who runs David Demand Progress, the group that he founded, that many of you know from the SOPA fight. Aaron loved recounting this conversation. David called him one night and said to Aaron, remember that year when we defeated SOPA got indefinite ten detention, ruled unconstitutional, and got both political parties to incorporate internet freedom into their, on, into their platforms at the conventions. That was Aaron, David Siegel, and a couple other people. They did all that in one year. Everybody here is capable of that kind of change. There are so many places in our world where that kind of change can happen just from having somebody there, somebody paying attention, somebody pushing. If you're a programmer or technologist like many of you in the audience today, you have special powers and special responsibilities. I went to a talk once that Aaron gave where he spoke to a dozen, maybe a couple dozen people like the people in this room, to programmers who he was trying to convince to work in politics. And he told them, you can do magic. Aaron really could do magic. And I'm dedicated to making sure that his magic doesn't end with his death. I hope you'll join me.
I first met Aaron online on various W3C mailing lists for XML and RDF. He kind of came out of nowhere at the end of um, 2001, as far as I could tell. <clears throat> Aaron's comments were thoughtful and informative, and it became clear pretty quickly that he had a better understanding of markup languages and data modeling than a lot of others on the list, even some of the veterans. Aaron had a talent for simplifying things and getting to the heart of everyone's concerns. He was also rather politically disarming because he was, well, a kid. <laughs> a kid with no ulterior motives except wanting to be included and taken seriously, as seriously as others. In April 2002, during the very early stages of the Creative Commons, I let Aaron know that we were having a technical meeting at Harvard that I wanted him to attend. But that was it. I really wanted to <clears throat> include him in the whole project <clears throat> almost as deeply as I was involved in the project. <clears throat> I told him this was happening for real and with him included. <laughs> it was then that he let me know that he was only 14 years old <clears throat> and that I needed to give his mother a call so we could figure things out. When I first insisted that Aaron attend this meeting, everybody, even Lawrence Lessig at first, thought that was really weird. <laughs> do you need Aaron to do your job? Was a pretty popular question. And the answer was clearly yes. I needed Aaron to make sure that our licensing markup was the absolute best that it could be. People were usually skeptical about Aaron and his abilities when they first found out he was only 14. But once they spoke to him for even a little while, he would always win them over. I knew if Lessig met him in person that that would be that, and it was. Aaron was growing up to become quite the technological statesman. So my strategy in the spring of 2002 was to introduce Aaron to as many people as I could and to in introduce him to the right people. This included people from the EFF and the Internet Archive, mainly, and also included going to cool events like South by Southwest in 2003, when he tried to get his own room in the cool hotel right across from the venue, um, but ended up getting a room in the janky hotel down the road with me, where I could be his official adult supervision. <laughs> In October 2002, Aaron flew out to Washington, D.C. to camp out in front of the Supreme Court with me and about eight other people. This was the night before Lawrence Lessig's oral argument in Eldred versus Ashcroft. This is the Eldred shirt from that. <laughs> um, we were rather surprised that Aaron convinced his mother to let him go, <laughs> but there he was, staying in the same bed and breakfast where I was staying. I told them he was sort of like my little brother, and that wasn't very far from the truth. He was a little brother that I ended up looking up to. EFF, <clears throat> EFF staff technologist Seth Schoen took over as Aaron's chaperone pretty quickly during that trip to Washington, D.C. There was a moment at about 1 a.m. when Aaron asked if he could walk around the block with Seth. I thought they were kidding at first. <laughs> were they serious? Were they crazy? But then I realized it was one of those rite of passage moments. Plus, I realized he wouldn't be by himself. He was with Seth. I think at that moment, I passed on the torch to Seth as Aaron's West Coast guardian. But we always stayed in touch. His birthday was two days before mine, and he would remember my birthday almost every year and would send me a nice little email wishing me a good next year. Thank you. As Lisa was just recounting, I met Aaron at the Supreme Court in October of 2002 and we had gone to hear the oral argument in Eldred versus Ashcroft. Most of us non-lawyers 
had to spend the night sleeping in the street in line in front of the court in order to get a ticket. The line for the oral argument starts the night before. But even though Aaron was a teenager, he was Larry Lessig's personal guest at the argument. So since he had a ticket, he had the luxury of spending the night in a hotel, which his parents apparently really appreciated. But Aaron decided to spend most of the night and most of the morning before the argument hanging out with us at the encampment in front of the court, in part to show solidarity with the people who hadn't received a ticket, and in part for the thrill of meeting actual grown-up copyright activists. <laughs> Aaron was truly starstruck to meet people he thought of as legendary copyright reform activists. But within a decade, Aaron himself would be among the most effective grassroots copyright activists in the whole world. At that moment, he was the little kid markup and metadata expert that Larry Lessig admired enough to give him a front row Supreme Court seat. And Aaron spent the evening with us as we ordered pizza, which he could actually eat, for delivery to the sidewalk outside the Supreme Court, which was apparently not a very unusual request for pizzerias in DC. <laughs> and all of us gossiped about copyright law for a couple of hours. Um, I saw Aaron again in December. Uh, my friends Leonard and Sumana found a picture. He's visiting my house. And I come, uh, like some people here, from a book family, and I have a lot of books. And we spent about three hours with Leonard and Sumana and Aaron and I, just sitting on my bed, sort of manually following hyperlinks between books. Oh, that book. Oh, well, that's a reference to that book. Um, Aaron was there because Larry Lessig was unveiling his Creative Commons project in San Francisco. And Lessig had invited Aaron clad in a t-shirt, probably the youngest person in the entire hall, up on stage to talk about metadata. It was very awkward. Aaron was trying to describe why it was useful to be able to represent bibliographic information in a machine-readable format. And in fact, Aaron was always trying to describe why it was useful to be able to represent bibliographic information in a machine-readable <laughs> format. The audience had had a few drinks, I think, and wasn't as focused as it might have been, and didn't really care to envision this beautiful future in which search engines would make it easy for everyone to find works they could legally reuse and build upon, which they now can, thanks to Aaron's work. But the audience didn't seem to get it. Lessig was very gracious, and he basically said to the crowd, see, our project is going to succeed, and it's going to succeed because we have this genius creating our infrastructure. Aaron reminded me how frustrating it is to be curious about things that other people don't understand or that other people regard as trivial or bizarre. He wrote a blog post about a theory that one's degree of nearsightedness is affected by blood oxygen levels and that it might be possible to use eye exercises to systematically reduce nearsightedness. Aaron, he wrote, was already experimenting on himself to see if it would work, and he said he wished he could meet a girl who wouldn't laugh at this project. Later, Aaron met Seth Roberts, a researcher who advocates self-experimentation as a way of generating potentially useful wild ideas about health. Roberts and Aaron got along extremely well. I think that Roberts, like many other people, felt that Aaron naturally generated potentially useful wild ideas about absolutely everything. I visited Aaron in his dorm at Stanford a few years later. I was thrilled that he had the opportunity to study at such a great university. But Aaron was alienated from Stanford. He had few friends, and the students around him weren't curious about the things he was curious about. This wasn't the way his Stanford adventure was supposed to pan out. I helped him pack for his flight to Boston for his interview with Paul Graham, who was starting a fund to invest in young people just like Aaron. It went well. Aaron dropped out of Stanford, moved to Boston. In 2006, just after Condé Nast acquired Reddit, just before they fired Aaron, Aaron and I were at a hacker conference together in Berlin. To Larry Lessig's chagrin, Aaron and Lessig had, at that time, fallen out of touch. Perhaps neither of them were deeply involved in the day-to-day -day work of Creative Commons, which had brought them together. Aaron had gone off to work in the startup world while simultaneously deepening his study of left-wing politics, macroeconomics, and sociology. Lessig and Aaron were both planning to tell America, as a matter of some urgency, what had gone wrong with the American project 
but they had slightly different diagnoses. A friend and I took Aaron out to Wannsee, where Lessig was spending a year at the American Academy in Berlin. Lessig looked extraordinarily proud to see Aaron. Their meeting had for me the sense of an extraordinarily poignant reunion, as if they hadn't seen each other in 20 years. Of course, they had actually seen each other a few months before. But my friend and I left the two of them alone for an hour or so, and I remember as we walked away, seeing Lessig and Aaron leaning against a wall at the Vanse train station, talking animatedly to each other. It reminded me of the scene at the climax of the German film Goodbye Lenin, where we can see but not hear the actors talking about incredibly urgent matters, and we have to imagine for ourselves what they must be saying to each other. And I thought, Lessig is so proud, his protege is all grown up, and he's come back to show his respect for his teacher. Aaron was a free speech absolutist, free speech absolutist, an idealist's idealist, an activist's activist, and I must say, a libertarian socialist's libertarian socialist. <laughs> his credo was that bits are not a bug, that come hell or high water we should celebrate and not fear people's ability to communicate to each other whatever they might choose to communicate and the infrastructure that supports that ability. Aaron came of age a long time after the end of the cypherpunk movement, but he always seemed like a cypherpunk and lived up to the notion that cypherpunks write code. He channeled all sorts of different idealisms of supposedly bygone eras. You would have thought he was too young to know about those idealisms. And he did it in a way that mixed intelligence, creativity, and humor. In the long run, Aaron felt that he was going to fix the world mainly by clearly explaining it to people. <laughs> I believe Aaron grew up to be exactly the person that he would have been most astonished and excited to meet in the line in front of the Supreme Court. I've never known anyone else like him. So I know we have all been spending a lot of time thinking about Aaron and his life and what kind of person he was and what he did. I know many of you in the room knew him, knew him well. Others probably never got to meet him in person, saw him on a mailing list or read his blog posts um, and are now trying to, to figure out what we've lost, who we've lost. And for me, you know, I was lucky enough, I got to live with Aaron for a while, and we got to be good friends and work on things together, but I found I was always trying to figure out exactly who he was and what he was up to, because he was such a, a complicated and contradictory human being, uh, and he'd get you in these ways that you weren't expecting. Um, some, of the, some of this was simple, obvious stuff, you know, I, he and I had met before, but we moved to San, Fran San Francisco at the same time. I came here to work for the EFF. Uh, he was just in the process of selling Reddit and going to Condé Nast and going through the, the messy divorce that he had with the other co-founders. And so I sent him an email and said, hey, I'm setting up a share house. Do you want, to, like, do you want a place to live? Um, and he said yes. Um, and so we had this, this rambling Victorian in this apartment building uh, and I said, oh, we've got all these you know, open rooms we need to fill. And he's like, oh, there's this tiny little one in the corner. I'll take that. This, this room was the size of a, you know, it was a closet, basically. Um, and he was the, we were pretty sure he was the wealthiest person in the building. He just sold Reddit. Um, but he wanted this, this tiny little thing. Um, and getting, getting to know him was weird. Like, I, I, I knew him, I knew his blog, I'd met him before, but living with him, the first experience was he was so shy. Like, he'd just be there and, like, in his own little world, struggling to talk to people until the, the conversation took the right turn. You'd say the right thing to him, and he would come alive. Um, and he would come so alive. Um, I know Danny mentioned the Chinese room argument, but I remember the, the, the day that somehow I prodded him about that. Um, 
And then for the next week, you know, like, we, we were going at it. I, like, I think he was totally wrong about the Chinese room argument, actually. Still, I st still do. Um, his position was crazy. Uh, he defended a crazy position very well. Um, and I had to argue him into so many weird corners to, to get anywhere. Um, I, I remember another scene. We had a, a film crew who showed up and stayed in our house and filmed this, this thing, steal this film. You can go and see it on the internet. You can see Aaron in it. Um, and we, we were, there were a documentary crew talking about copyright and trying to, trying to film these takes in the middle of the night in our cramped little living room. And everyone was kind of drunk and there was chaos. And I remember some of us were really struggling to say anything coherent to a camera. But someone pointed a camera at Aaron and he caught fire. Like, he, he just, he taught me how to, like, speak to a room or speak, speak to a, um, a television or whatever it was. He just had a message that he'd simplified out of the ether uh, and could deliver. Um, and that was the same skill he turned to politics um, and to so much else that he did in his intellectual life. And it was beautiful to watch. So, and he paired that with this, you know, honestly, he had a flair for self-promotion. Uh, there wouldn't be hundreds of people in this room and hundreds of people in all, all the rooms for all the memorials that he's ha had in different cities and millions of people reading about him if he didn't have some little talent uh, at getting the things he was doing out to the world in a way that people would notice. Uh, people noticed his 16-year-old self, his 14-year-old self. But he wasn't just a giant ego who kind of was out there promoting himself because he thought he was awesome. He actually, the one thing he failed to care about often was taking care of himself. And I, I remember like living with him and, and trying to get, get him to eat and he, he wouldn't, the, and I, he, had, he had medical things that he was struggling with. And I said, Aaron, you know, like, how does this work? Like, let's talk about it. Surely you've read the research on this condition. Like, we can go through, through the, you know, what's been tried. And he said, no, I haven't read any of it. Like, I don't know anything about it. And I said, Aaron, you devour books. Like, I can see you devouring books. You've, you've read five this week. Like, you have a stack of academic journal articles by your bed. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about half of them. Why haven't you read anything about this condition that is making your own life harder? He just said, well, I don't think I'm that important. The world's important. Like, and, you know, watching that happen was, was kind of, um, was hard. You, you know, you struggle to take care of him. And he also had these days that were down. I mean, I guess it was a down day in the end that got him. In between the days when he was doing amazing amounts of stuff, you all know how much he did. He was too young to possibly have done a third of the things he managed and with, who knows what he would have achieved within another 50 years. But in between those days, there'd be, there'd be days when he was just blue. And I, I remember I caught him on one of those and said, Aaron, like, there's amazing stuff. We can go and do it right now. And he just said, no, I, the code, it's all terrible. It's ugly. It's broken. I'm like, okay, we, we, you know, let's do some science. And he, he, he'd say... No, like, you know, the data doesn't work. It sucks. Like, it's too hard. And I said, surely there must be something that you'd be happy doing that really, like, would feel right. And he stopped for a while and said, yes, actually, typography. <laughs> I could do typography. Anyway, so... He was contradictory. You never knew exactly what to make of him. Um, he was brilliant and sometimes infuriating like, and wrong, like the Chinese room argument. But then sometimes, you know, I, I guess I'm talking about paradoxes in Aaron. Sometimes he was infuriating and wrong and brilliant at the same time. Um, and I have one story about a paradox. You know, he and I were talking about moral philosophy, ethical philosophy. We were both interested in these ideas, the Singerian ideas of you know, actually, we have a responsibility to find the thing that we can do that, that makes the most difference to the universe, to the world, and, and makes it better, whatever that means. But I had, had just read a, a paper about a paradox showing that actually, 
if you write down all of our most compelling intuitions about what it is for the world to be good, so that we can know how to make it better, um, you write them all down, you can actually mathematically prove it's a recent result, 10 years old, by a, a Swedish philosopher. Our, our deepest intuitions about this are flatly contradictory. It's a paradox. Like There is actually no co completely coherent definition uh, of what makes the world better. And Aaron just looked at me and said, that's completely wrong. Like, actually, no, it's like this, this, and this. And I said, Aaron, you're arguing with a mathematical theorem. I have a proof of it right here. Like, you're not pointing out any flaws in the logic in this paper. And he said, no, no, it's like, and then I, I, I stopped and I, I, I stared at him for a while and I said, I'm not sure you're right, but actually maybe we can find a way out of this theorem. Like, it's not an impossibility theorem, it's not a paradox. Actually, it's, maybe it's more like an uncertainty theorem. We can rehabilitate it as a, a kind of um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for morality. You can't be completely sure about what's right, but you, you can actually pin the amount of uncertainty down to a minimum and, and still get the right answers to obvious moral dilemmas. Um, and so he and I like actually sat down and wrote a paper about this, which we still haven't published. I, like I now actually have a, this is a thing I promised to, to Aaron's ghost. I'm gonna finish that paper and maybe people will read it. Um, but he was paradoxical and yet he got so much done, did so many amazing things at the same time. <sighs> There's a lot more I wanna say and there are a lot of things that we all need to do. Um, because Aaron's loss reminded us or pointed out that they needed to be done. Um, some of them are things that matter a lot to this community here in this room. Uh, we need to free the literature, the scientific literature that Aaron died trying to free. And we also need to figure out what we can, what we can do to fix the insane criminal justice system in the United States. But I've said enough for tonight, and there are other people who will take up these threads. I've been asked how I, as a publisher uh, who has an online service that you know, puts content behind a paywall, could possibly be a supporter of Aaron Schwartz, this guy who, you know, downloads content from, you know, services like that. And my answer is that we're trying to invent the future and that the future does not look like the past. And the future is uncovered by struggle to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And the people who figure that out are people to whom we owe an enormous debt. I was trying to think of, you know, past experiences with Aaron uh, when I first met him. He came to our FU camp and our ETEC conferences. Uh, but what I decided to share with you is uh, a poem that I read as part of a talk. Uh, that I gave at our ETEC conference in 2008. And I checked, and I, I, just to refresh memory, Aaron was there. And um, the poem was part of a talk entitled, Why I Love Hackers. And I started out with a picture of some berries, some poisonous ones, and some ones that were good to eat. And I said, somewhere way back in time, somebody had the courage to figure out which of these things were good to eat. And we talked about, I talked about, uh, you know, people wanting to fly. That was this crazy dream. And eventually we figured it out. And lots of other stories from the history of hacking. And then I ended with a poem which seems singularly appropriate uh, for Aaron because it's about both the courage to try to do what hasn't been done to change the world, but also how hard that is and the challenge of it. It's a poem called The Man Watching. 
by Rainer Maria Rilke, in translation by Robert Bly. He said, I can tell by the way the trees beat after so many dull days on my worried window panes that a storm is coming, and I hear the far-off fields say things I can't bear without a friend, I can't love without a sister. The storm, the shifter of shapes, drives on across the woods and across time, and the world looks as if it had no age. The landscape, like a line in the psalm book, is seriousness and weight and eternity. What we choose to fight is so tiny. What fights with us is so great. If only we would let ourselves be dominated as things do by some immense storm, we would become strong too and not need names. When we win, it's with small things, and the triumph itself makes us small. What is extraordinary and eternal does not want to be bent by us. I mean, the angel who appeared to the wrestlers of the Old Testament, when the wrestler's sinews grew long like metal strings, he felt them under his fingers like chords of deep music. Whoever was beaten by this angel, who often simply declined the fight, went away proud and strengthened and great from that harsh hand that needed him as if to change his shape. Winning does not tempt that man. This is how he grows, by being defeated decisively by constantly greater beings. I don't know whether Aaron was defeated or victorious, uh, but we are certainly shaped by the hand uh, of the things that he wrestled with. I didn't know Aaron quite as well as many who have been so generous in sharing their memories. But as a member of the Board of Directors of Creative Commons, I am honored to be here to convey CC's grief, our gratitude, and our commitment to continuing to work toward the world of openness and sharing that Aaron worked to architect for all of us. Many of you recently helped to celebrate the 10th birthday of Creative Commons, commemorating the launch in December 2002 of our first suite of open content licenses at the party that Seth described. But of course, there was a gestation period before the birth of CC, and that's when I met Aaron, thanks to Lisa. I think he was 15 when I met him, but appeared to be about 11. As most of you know, Creative Commons is a steward of a set of public content licenses. They have license deeds and legal code and RDF metadata that is designed to make the licenses human readable and lawyer readable and machine readable. That's the beauty of the CC vision, but it's also a challenge. It's a challenge to find any one person who can really wrap their heads around and talk about this idea. A person who understands humans and lawyers and machines. So when Lisa and I first described CC at the O'Reilly Emerging Technology Conference in May 2002, we needed some help. Speaking for myself, I was human, and I was a lawyer, but I didn't read or speak machine. So the idea of explaining what CC would have to do with HTML, XML, RDF, and the W3C terrified me. So I gave a presentation in which I said some boring things about law and some vague things about metadata. Lisa gave a demonstration that I think was more exciting. But when the complicated questions from the audience started, we handed the mic down to little Aaron. With some trepidation, I'd just met the kid, but it was an act for me of pure desperation. <laughs> I couldn't answer those questions about RDF, and I figured, well, at least he's adorable. Of course, I found Aaron's notes on the presentation still online this afternoon. They read almost like poetry. We did the Creative Commons intro in the morning. 
Lisa forgot the VGA dongle for her iBook, so I donated mine instead. Whole thing seemed to go over pretty well. I answered a couple of questions at the end. I think Aaron answered all of the questions. And I was wrong to be nervous about it. Of course, he could answer the questions and delight the audience, not with his adorableness, not only that, with his vision and with his ability to communicate it to all of us. We were finally hearing from someone who could explain to humans and even to lawyers how to harness the power of machines to overcome unnecessary limits on sharing. Aaron's vision, more powerful than I could explain or even comprehend. How to harness the power of machines to overcome unnecessary limits on sharing. It was a vision Aaron pursued for CC, but far beyond CC as well, as many of you can attest better than I. But Aaron was not a machine, and he was not a lawyer. He was a human and tragically mortal. But his vision was not. The answers he gave to our questions were not. He shared them, and so we still have them. And the people in this room are dedicated to sharing them forward and to making the machines for sharing them forward work better and better and to making the law for sharing them forward work better and better. I want to end with something else that Aaron shared. It's just a casual email to a W3C list from August 2002. To me, it captures his brilliance, his gift for communicating, his vision of sharing, and his generous spirit. Hi there. If you haven't already heard, Creative Commons is a new nonprofit organization working to make it easier for copyright holders to share their work by dedicating it to the public domain or licensing it to the public on generous terms. As part of that effort, we've been working hard to develop our licenses and metadata strategy over the past few months. When we launch our site, we want to not only give our users licenses, but also a sample of RDF that they can add to their web page. We're hoping that by spreading these chunks of RDF around the web, we'll provide a useful base that interesting projects and applications can exploit. For more information, please check out our website. We'd appreciate your comments, thoughts, and code. Please send them to the CC Metadata mailing list. We'll be monitoring the list and responding to your questions. Thanks, Aaron. We'll be monitoring the list and responding to your questions. I hope that somehow Aaron is monitoring this list. I hope we return to his words and his vision to help answer our questions and that we share those answers with our fellow humans. To Aaron, thank you. Thank you for sharing. So unlike a lot of the people here, I didn't know Aaron. Uh, I never met him, didn't speak to him on the phone, never even got to exchange email with him, which ironically is <clears throat> why I'm here. Um, the fact that I didn't know him is the reason why I was going to be the person that was put forth to objectively explain to the jury of what Aaron did. Um, and I think I was able to hold on to that objectivity until the, uh, the last week and a half. Uh, and per Taryn's comments, I've perhaps become much more radical uh, than I was before, which you can tell because I'm wearing my radical tie um, today. Um, but, you know, my, what we were going to do is we were, I was objectively going to go in front of that jury and explain to them that these horrible hacking crimes that Aaron was accused of uh, is functionally the same as putting the incorrect email address to an airport Wi-Fi or going down the street to Starbucks to change your IP address. Um, and Dan Purcell was going to get up there and grill the MIT and JSTOR witnesses um, and talk to them about how this kind of thing happens dozens and dozens of times a year at MIT, and yet Aaron is the first person um, to ever have the Secret Service get involved. Um, and that JSTOR witness was going to talk about how oh, there wasn't really any damage, we were a little ticked off, um, but this isn't a big deal for us and we don't want this to happen. 
And then Elliot Peters is going to get up uh, and give this fiery defense attorney speech, uh, pounding the table and pointing to Boston Harbor um, and invoking the American Revolution um, and the spirit of freedom and how Aaron lives up to the, the greatest ideals uh, in our founding documents. And then Aaron's future was going to be in the hands of 12 normal people. I mean, normal people who couldn't get out of jury duty. Um, but hopefully people who I think would have had the sense to understand that there was a huge chasm between the way Aaron was being portrayed by the government and the young man who was sitting there at that table. And I had faith in them. Um, and we're not going to get that chance to do all those things. And we can't help Aaron anymore. Uh, but I think we, and by we I mean everybody who is listening to this, we can help the next Aaron. And we didn't have to wait very long for the next Aaron, right? The, the next Aaron is the uh, Chinese American man who is accused of stealing source code from a hedge fund and is being prosecuted under the Espionage Act. Um, the next Aaron is the Canadian student who was expelled from his university for pointing out security flaws to the university uh, in their software that exposed his personal information. Um, the next Aaron is going to be that young lady whose DEF CON speech is interrupted by the clink of handcuffs, or that grand grandfather who is mystified by the demand for $50,000 to pay uh, for copyright violations because his next door neighbor uses open Wi-Fi to do a little bit torrent. Those are the next errands, and those are the people we can help. Um, and one of the reasons I think we really need to help him is while I think all of us feel gratified about the outpouring of love and care um, and the feeling of momentum that has come out of the last week and a half, uh, we also have to be really aware that we want that when people face the same kind of odds that Aaron face, and many of them without Aaron's resources, that we want them not to think of Aaron's final moments of weakness and doubt to be the kind of thing that they need to do to bring about change, right? And there's two things we need to do for that. One. One, we need to give those people as much support as Aaron was able to give, right? That those people uh, don't know Larry Lessig. Uh, they don't hang out with Harvard law professors um, and MIT professors, but yet they need the kind of support that Aaron was able to muster. Uh, and, and one of the things I realized through this whole thing is um, we, we never consider computer science to be the kind of thing that is a profession that changes lives. Uh, and something that we've, this has demonstrated is that being able to make an argument of whether a MAC address is, this, is just something that you use to keep collisions from happening on a network and is not equivalent to the serial number on a gun, that making that argument is the kind of thing that can mean spending decades in prison. Um, and, and there are other professions that are life changing, medicine and law, and in those professions people have an idea about equal access and helping people, and that doesn't happen in reality, but at least they try, right? There's the idea that everybody has a defense lawyer, there's an idea that you can go and get treated by a doctor and they have an ethical obligation to you, and I think those of us in the computer world need to see via Aaron's tragedy that we have the same kind of obligation. And. The, the second thing we all need to do is when we are up here speaking or we're commenting on Reddit or Hacker News or talking to people about Aaron, while we talk about the positive change that is going to come out of his death, we have to make it clear that all of those positive things pale in comparison to what he would have done had he lived, right? And that's... That's an important part of the message because we don't want those young people to think that their only way out um, is, is to sacrifice themselves, that they deserve to live too, and that they have people who are standing behind them. So, thank you. Good evening. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're all starting with how we met Aaron, um, and I think I met Aaron before this, but my first real memory of him is on the steps of the United States Supreme Court on the night before the Eldred argument in 2002. And I remember thinking, does your mother know you're here? Um, and I recently found his account of that night, and it reminded me of how very young he was, how excited he was to be at the court, 
and yet his understanding of the nuances of the Copyright Term Extension Act were better than mine at that time. Um, and I also realized that by having our first, or at least the first I'd met really fanboy, that we were building a movement. Um, since the early morning of January 12th, when I learned that Aaron had passed away, I, I feel like I've had a little Aaron on my shoulder, um, reminding me that we are still part of a movement and demanding that we push forward, push further, and that the tragedy of his death be parts of the roots of something good and something better. Um, I don't think Aaron named his organization Demand Progress by accident. And at EFF, we feel this intensely, and I think we feel it in two directions. First, we feel the need to continue his work, opening access to publicly funded and public domain information for all people so that you don't have to be in an ivory tower to learn. And the second, though, is the one that I've spent most of my time on for the last few weeks, and, and that was number four on Taryn's list, which is trying to fix the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, EFF has a draft of some modest fixes that would reduce the ability of prosecutors to use the CFAA and similar computer laws to ratchet up threats on people like Aaron. It's on our website. It's on Reddit. Um, Representative Zoe Lofgren, as many of you know, has led the way and remains willing to help, but we have to create the space for real change, not, not, not real change, and that, that remains to be done. Um, her initial proposals are not sufficient. We have a lot of work to do to get this where it will be, um, but we need to ensure that what happened to Aaron never happens to another bright, idealistic, geeky kid who wants to make the world a better place. And if we can't do it in Congress, then we need to do it in the courts. But we need your help. In fact, we need the help of everyone you all know. We need to marshal the same sort of support for this fight that we were able to marshal with SOPA, about SOPA and PIPA, and maybe even more, since this involves not just Hollywood, but federal prosecutors and federal power. And we won't have Aaron. I was hesitant to kind of make this kind of bold pitch at Aaron's memorial, but honestly, I don't think Aaron would forgive me if I didn't. We can't help Aaron directly anymore, but we can help the next Aaron and the one after that, and all of us who would be the beneficiaries of what those next Aaron's will create for us and the knowledge that they will make available to all the rest of us and all the people around the world. I think we built the movement that I first saw by seeing the little fanboy Aaron Schwartz in 2002. So now, let's use it. Wow. I learned from Aaron what living an open source life was like. I think he really did live that way. He floated and helped others. He gave everything away. He really wasn't tied to an institution. He really was not a company man in any sense. Uh, he was really quite pure uh, in his motivations, and it made him incredibly effective of cutting through a lot of the stuff that most of us deal with an open source life. He was able to keep his self-interest at bay, um, which is kind of remarkable um, for a lot of us, um, but he was able to do it. And he was able to, to communicate well with an open smile and a kind heart. He had his, a way of spending time and his energy on things that mattered. And he had a genius at finding things that mattered to millions of people. There are lots of things to work on, but the things that he worked on were incredibly effective. We first met, I think, in 2002 at the Eldred um, uh, Supreme Court case uh, in Washington, D.C., when we drove a bookmobile across, celebrating the public domain by giving away books that kids made, uh, and also then at the Creative Commons launch. 
But I really got to know Aaron when he said, I'd really like to help make the Open Library website with the Internet Archive to go and give books and integrate books into the Internet itself. And he said, I've got this cool technology called Infogami. It made really possible to make Reddit happen. Um, let's use it again for this other thing. And it was wonderful to work uh, with him. But it was really unlike working with anybody else I've ever, I've ever met. I mean, it was, it, you certainly couldn't tell him what to do. He just kind of did what was the right thing to do. And he was right certainly a lot more often than I was. He also, we worked together in other areas when he was a champion of open access, especially of the public domain, bringing public access to the public domain. Most people think that's kind of an obvious thing. Isn't the public domain mean that it's publicly accessible? Of course, all of us think, no. I mean, it's sort of like there are these national parks with moats and walls and guns and turrets sort of pointing out in case somebody might want to come near the public domain. Um, and Aaron didn't think this was right. And he spent a lot of time and effort freeing this materials. One of the first ones that we were actively working together on was freeing government court cases so that anybody could see this without having to have special privilege or money and also to make it so you could data mine it and go and look at these things in a very different way. So he freed and liberated um, a lot of court cases in, from the PACER uh, system and uploaded them in bulk to the Internet Archive so that people could have access to these. There are now four million documents from 800,000 cases that have been used by six million people because of the project that Aaron Schwartz and others helped start. It was an interesting project because it went over many different organizations, each playing a role in all cooperating in a very non-corporate way. It was a very Aaron style way of making things happen. And the idea of making court documents uh, and legal documents available more easily struck a chord with me because in college, I was trying to figure out how I was gonna try to get out of the draft. And my college didn't have uh, a legal collection. And the only way I could try to get to legal court documents was to get an ID from my professor and break in to the Harvard Law Library to go and read court documents. <laughs> that sucked. Uh, it really makes no sense. And Aaron not only sort of saw that it doesn't make sense, he decided he was going to try to help solve this, not just for himself, but for everyone. Then there was other public domain collections, like the Google Books collection. Google Books uh, was a library project to go and digitize lots and lots of books. Um, a lot of them were public domain. Google uh, would make them available from their website, but really, really painfully. It, it would make it so that if you wanted one book, you could get one book. If you wanted 100 books, they'd turn off your IP address forever. Um, this is no way to have public access to the public domain. And the Internet Archive started getting these uploads of Google Books going faster and faster and faster. It's like, well, where are these coming from? Well, it turns out it's Aaron. Uh, and uh, he and a bunch of friends figured out that they could go and get a bunch of computers to go slowly enough to just clock through tons of, of Google Books and upload them to the Internet Archive. Interestingly, Google never got upset about it. The libraries, on the other hand, grumbled, which is, uh, well, anyway, they'll, they'll get over it. Um, uh, <laughs> So we, when this started happening, we said, okay, what's going on? What, should we be concerned? No, it's public domain. Uh, we just made sure that we got the cataloging data right and we linked back to Google so that if you're on the book, you can go back to the original page and see the da-da-da-da-da. Um, and it all um, uh, worked well. But there it was, 
Aaron doing it again, bringing public access to the public domain. What is crushing to me is that Aaron got ensnared by the federal government for doing something that the Internet Archive actively encourages others to do for our collections. And we think all libraries should encourage, which is bulk downloading to support data mining and other research using computers. This is just the way the world works. The first step is for a computer to read and analyze materials is to download a set of documents. When Aaron did this from one library, JSTOR, they strongly objected and demanded that MIT find and stop that user, which then led US prosecutors to pull out their worst techniques. Did anybody stop to ask if bulk downloading is a crime? I say no. Bulk downloading is not in itself a crime. Let's stop, incur let's stop this from, let's stop this practice of discouraging bulk downloading because there are encouraging projects that are learning amazing new things by having computers be part of the research process. Let's not stop this and discourage young people from coming up with new and different ways to make access, uh, to, to learn things from our libraries. What resulted was, tr in this case, was tragic and not necessary. Really what we want is computers to be able to read. Aaron knew this, we're all building this, and he got ensnared anyway. Let's let our computers read. Because of this tragedy, JSTOR, I talked to you this morning, and the Internet Archive have agreed to meet to discuss the broad issue of data mining and web crawling. I hope that we really make progress. At least there's reasons to be positive. This assault on Aaron would disillusion, discourage, and depress any principled young man. And if there ever was a principled young man, it was Aaron Schwartz. We miss you, and we will carry on your important work. Do not, do not think for a moment, do not think for a moment that Aaron's work on JSTOR was the random act of a lone hacker, some kind of crazy spur of the moment bulk download. JSTOR had long come in for withering criticism from the net. Larry Lessig called JSTOR a moral outrage in a talk, and I suppose I have to confess, he was quoting me, and we weren't the only ones fanning those flames. Sequestering knowledge behind paywalls, making scientific journals, only available to a few kids fortunate enough to be at fancy universities and charging $20 an article for the remaining 99% of us was a festering wound. It offended many people. It embarrassed many who wrote those articles that their work had become somebody's profit margin, a members only country club of knowledge. Many of us helped fan those flames and many of us feel guilty today for fanning those flames. But JSTOR was just one of many battles. They tried to paint Aaron as some kind of lone wolf hacker, a young terrorist who went on a crazy IP killing spree that caused $92 million in damages. But Aaron wasn't a lone wolf. He was part of an army. And I had the honor of serving with him for a decade. You've heard many things about his remarkable life, but I want to focus tonight on just one. Aaron was part of an army of citizens 
that believes democracy only works when the citizenry are informed, when we know about our rights and our obligations, an army that believes we must make justice and knowledge available to all, not just the well-born or those that have grabbed the reins of power, so that we may govern ourselves more wisely. He was part of an army of citizens that rejects kings and generals and believes in rough consensus and running code. We worked together on a dozen government databases. When we worked on something, the decisions weren't rash. Our work often took months, sometimes years, sometimes a decade, and Aaron Swartz did not get his proper serving of decades. We looked at and poked at the US copyright database for a long time. It was a system so old, it was still running ways. <laughs> the government had, believe it or not, asserted copyright on the copyright database. Now, how you copyright a database that is specifically called out in the United States Constitution is beyond me. But we knew we were playing with fire by violating their terms of use. So we were careful. We grabbed that data, and it was used to feed the open library here at the Internet Archive, and it was used to feed Google Books, and we got a letter from the Copyright Office waiving copyright on that copyright database. But before we did that, we had to talk to many lawyers and worry about the government hauling us in for malicious, premeditated bulk downloading. These were not random acts of aggression. We worked on databases to make them better, to make our democracy work better, to help our government. We were not criminals. When we brought in 20 million pages of US district court documents from behind their eight cent per page pacer paywall, we found those public filings infested with privacy violations, names of minor children, names of informants, medical records, mental health records, financial records, and tens of thousands of social security numbers. We were whistleblowers. And we sent our results to the chief judges of 31 district courts, and those judges were shocked and dismayed, and they redacted those documents, and they yelled at the lawyers that filed them, and the judicial conference changed their privacy rules. But you know what the bureaucrats did? You know what the bureaucrats did who ran the administrative office of the United States courts? To them, we weren't citizens that made public data better. We were thieves that took $1.6 million of their property. So they called the FBI. They said they were hacked by criminals, an organized gang that was imperiling their $120 million per year revenue stream selling public government documents. The FBI sat outside Aaron's house. They called him up and tried to sucker him into meeting them without his lawyer. The FBI sat two armed agents down in an interrogation room with me to get to the bottom of this alleged conspiracy. But we weren't criminals. We were only citizens. We did nothing wrong. They found nothing wrong. We did our duty as citizens, and the government investigation had nothing to show for it but a waste of a whole lot of time and money. If you want a chilling effect, sit somebody down with a couple FBI agents for a while and see how quickly their blood runs cold. There are people who face danger every day to protect us, police officers and firefighters and emergency workers, and I am grateful and amazed by what they do, but the work that people like Aaron and I did, slinging DVDs and running shell scripts on public materials should not be a dangerous profession. We weren't criminals, but there were crimes committed, crimes against the very idea of justice. When the US attorney told Aaron he had to plead guilty to 13 felonies for attempting to propagate knowledge, before she'd even consider a deal, that was an abuse of power, a misuse of the criminal justice system. That was a crime against justice. 
and that U.S. attorney does not act alone. She is part of a posse intent on protecting property, not people. All over the United States, those without access to means don't have access to justice and face these abuses of power every day. It was a crime against learning when a nonprofit corporation like JSTOR, charged with advancing knowledge, turned a download that caused no harm and no damage into a $92 million federal case. And the JSTOR corporate monopoly on knowledge is not alone. All over the United States, Corporations have staked their fences on the field of education, for-profit colleges that steal from our veterans, non-profit standards bodies that ration public safety codes while paying million-dollar salaries, multinational conglomerates that measure the work of scientific papers and legal materials by their gross margins. In the JSTOR case, was the overly aggressive posture of the Department of Justice prosecutors and law enforcement officials revenge because they were embarrassed that, in their view at least, we somehow got away with something in the Pacer incident? Was the merciless JSTOR prosecution the revenge of embarrassed bureaucrats because they looked stupid in the New York Times, because the United States Senate called them on the carpet we will probably never know the answer to that question, but it sure looks like they destroyed a young man's life in a petty abuse of power. This was not a criminal matter. Aaron was not a criminal. If you think you own something, and I think that thing is public, I'm more than happy to meet you in a court of law, and if you're right, I'll take my lumps if I've wronged you. But when we turn armed agents of the law on citizens trying to increase access to knowledge, we've broken the rule of law, we've desecrated the temple of justice. Aaron Swartz was not a criminal. Aaron Swartz was a citizen, and he was a brave soldier in a war which continues today a war in which corrupt and venal profiteers try to steal and hoard and starve our public domain for their own private gain. When people try to restrict access to the law, or they try to collect tolls on the road to knowledge or deny education to those without means, those people are the ones who should face the stern gaze of an outraged public prosecutor. <laughs> What the Department of Justice put Aaron through for trying to make our world better is the same thing they can put you through. Our army isn't one lone wolf. It is thousands of citizens, many of you in this room, who are fighting for justice and knowledge. I say we are an army, and I use the word with cause, because we face people who want to imprison us for downloading a database to take a closer look. We face people who believe they can tell us what we can read and what we can say. But when I see our army, I see an army that creates instead of destroys. I see the army of Mahatma Gandhi walking peacefully to the sea to make salt for the people. I see the army of Martin Luther King walking peacefully but with determination to Washington to demand their rights because change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through continuous struggle. When I see our army, I see an army that creates new opportunities for the poor, an army that makes our society more just and more fair, an army that makes knowledge universal. When I see our army, I see the people who have created the Wikipedia and the Internet Archive, the people who coded GNU and Apache and Bind and Linux. I see the people who made the EFF and the Creative Commons. I see the people who created our Internet as a gift to the world. When I see our army, I see Aaron Swartz, and my heart is broken. We've truly lost one of our better angels. I wish we could change the past, but we cannot. But we can change the future, and we must. We must do so for Aaron. We must do so for ourselves. 
we must do so to make our world a better place, a more humane place, a place where justice works and access to knowledge becomes a human right. Thank you.